he too fills the place of lawful kings and claims to substitute his dynasty for theirs. He too, with his eyes fixed on that Italy, which he has twice conquered, looks on his empire as incomplete unless he reigns over the people of the peninsula at the same time as over the French. He too has seen all the Germans of the East rise in arms against the principle which he represents, and his lieutenants went to the places where Charlemagne fought in order to quell their revolt. When Napoleon says, I'm Charlemagne, because like Charlemagne, I once more unite my crown of France with that of the Lombards, and because my empire reaches to the East, the cry comes from his heart. It is from the imperial costume of Charlemagne also that he copies his coronation robes. It is the coat of arms attributed to Charlemagne, golden eagle on a blue field that he takes for his bearings. It is the imperial insignia of Charlemagne, the crown, the scepter, the sword of Charlemagne, which Kellerman, Perignon, and Lefebvre bear before him on the day of his coronation. Not from Charlemagne himself, it is from the Holy Roman Empire, founded by him that he borrows a greater part of the titles with which he invests the great dignitaries of his empire. Cavaceres is Arch-Chancellor of the Empire because there was in the College of Electors an Arch-Chancellor of the Empire who was Archbishop of Mans. Lebrun is Arch-Treasurer, as was the Count Palatine of the Rhine. Louis is Constable, not because a Constable uh, to the time of Louis the Thirteenth commanded the armies of the King of France, but because a Constable was one of the Palatines of Charlemagne. If the name of Grand Admiral is without precedent in the Germanic Empire, for even in France it dates only from Louis the Fourteenth and brings to our recollection only the Comte de Toulouse and the Duc de Pontiavre. It is in accordance with German traditions that the dignity of Grand Elector was taken, and it is again from the Holy Empire that we get those deputies who were appointed to supply the places the great dignitaries there are, the Vice Grand Elector and a Vice Constable in the Napoleonic Empire, because in the Holy Empire there were a Vice Grand Master of the Palace, a Vice Grand Marshal, a Vice Grand Chamberlain, and a Vice Grand Treasurer. As far then as possible in the great dignities of the empire. Napoleon copied, if not Charlemagne directly, at least with the successors of Charlemagne, he follows the same course. When, with a view of surrounding the fourth dynasty with a devoted body similar to that which the Bourbon kings possessed in their nobility, he institutes the Legion of Honor. The nobility of the empire with the latter, the similarity is remarkable. Like Charlemagne, Napoleon has his dukes and counts. He contemplates the creation of Margraves. When he admits barons and chevaliers, it is because the two titles are in use. In the Holy Empire, he creates princedoms, Essling, Ekmule, and Wagram. It is not until 1809 at Vienna, following the example of the Empress Germany, and lastly, when to the son for whom he hoped he assigned, even before he married Marie Louise Sonata's consultant of February 17, 1810, the title and honors the King of Rome. What more convincing proof can there be that the thought of Charlemagne and of the Holy Empire haunted him incessantly? Was it not in Germany that he found the title a king of the Romans given to the son of the emperor? To the emperor who was not crowned. And in the statement of the grounds of the Senatus Consult of 1810, does he not make his orator say Napoleon in the first days of his glory abstains from entering Rome as a conqueror? He waits till he can appear there as a father. It is his wish in that city to have the crown of Charlemagne placed on his head for a second time. Completus Napoleon dreamt the identity to be between his empire and that of Charlemagne. There were many points in which he was constrained to depart from the model he had chosen. For to satisfy the largest possible number of his companions in arms, he was compelled to multiply offices and in a lower rank than that of the great dignitaries of the Calavician origin to create other great officers, having for the most part no duties to perform, whose titles could only have relation to institutions which were in existence recently, or which could be created anew without ridicule. The twelve marshals of the empire, twelve as soon as Murat and Bertier were promoted to be grand dignitaries, have by their very number some air of resemblance to the twelve peers of Charlemagne. But the five colonels, general of cavalry, the inspectors general of artillery and of engineers, and the four inspectors of the coasts had no counterparts before the Valois and the Bourbon. 
These offices were purely ornamental. These grand officers of the empire would not any more than the grand dignitaries have daily duties to perform in the service of the emperor. Their posts form the excuse for large salaries, splendid uniforms, and nothing more. On days of ceremony, the grand dignitaries or the grand officers of the empire would take their place in suit certain rooms apart. They would form a cortege of the sovereign, or would surround his throne, but they knew not how to direct the court, nor how to superintend the very services of the emperor's house so as to give to both of them the dignity and the splendor which Napoleon desired. It became necessary, therefore, on this account, to have special officers who should be grand officers of the crown. If these important posts receive from him the same titles which they bore at the court of the Bourbon, it is for the reason that in every monarchy analogous duties must have similar titles everywhere the grand master or the grand marshal assumes the general direction of the household. The grand chamberlain has charge of that which belongs to the chamber or the wardrobe. The grand almoner watches over the spiritual department. The master of the horse directs the stables. The grand huntsman manages the hunts. In different countries, other accessory officers are created according to the wants of the service or the requirements of politics and of finance. Thus, we saw in France a grand butler, a grand cup bearer, a grand pintler, a grand falconer, a grand master of the wolfhounds, a grand cook, a grand master of the woods and forests, but with the exception of the grand huntsman and the grand almoner, which in several states are not found, we find everywhere these three offices essential to the state of the monarchy and to the majesty of the throne, the grand master, the grand chamberlain, and the master of the horse. These then, Napoleon was of necessity bound to reestablish, not as a grand master, for the title is too ambitious, but a grand marshal, as in Germany, a grand chamberlain and a master of the horse, for no court was without them. He appointed a grand almoner because such an office was customary in France, a master of the house for the same reason, and with equal rank, a grand master of the ceremonies, whose office is still more necessary than in former times, for all the new corners have to be taught in etiquette which many have forgotten, and which most have never known. Napoleon thus places himself on an equality of state with the other sovereigns of Europe. He constitutes his court essentially the same elements which form theirs. The customs of courts are everywhere the same, so that willing or unwilling, he is compelled to accept the traditional way of naming these offices which existed at the court of the Bourbons, which alone adapted itself to the times in which he lived. For in truth, the days of Charlemagne were somewhat remote. Having reestablished these titles, what duties shall he assign to their bearers? How shall he contrive to conciliate modern feeling, the spirit of equality, the spirit of the revolution, of which, in spite of all, he is the representative with the ceremonial, that hatefulness and absurdity of which he recognized? His aim was not so much to surpass in splendor the kings who preceded him and the sovereigns who were his contemporaries, it was especially to restore to the embodiment of authority all the splendor with which it was surrounded before the revolution. It was to attach to this new government a considerable number of ambitious men who, of their own accord, would come and occupy the positions he had designed for them, and who, to recover the titles which they had borne, or to receive similar titles, would have been in their ancient masters. It was to promote expenditure by the festivities which he would command, and thus foster national industries. It was to reestablish a center from which should radiate an example of politeness, of manners, and of fashion. It was lastly by the numerous barriers and the distance placed between the emperor and the people to increase the veneration of the multitude. But there is a wide distinction between such a course and any attempt to reestablish the power of the great officers of the crown and their subordinates on the same footing as under the Bourbons, or to resume the etiquette practice 14 years previously and to insist on its strict observance. If he desired to do so, it was impossible. 